Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to um, the Tax Day wine class, where um, taxes make us want to drink more, and Tax Day means rosé. Um, <laughs> um, I, it's, it's weird because tax day is normally much earlier in the year. Either way, tax day is normally associated with the release of a lot of different rosés, which are released right around the same time in, you know, April. Um, so super excited for this rosé wine class. Um, if you are logged in, um, please tell me where you're coming from um, in the chat room. Um, just uh, make sure that you're actually logged in. So on the upper right hand corner, if it just says sign in, then that means you're not logged in and you won't be able to participate in the chat room. So just make sure you're signed in so that you can participate in the chat room. If this video is playing up on a TV or a large screen, just also have it playing on a phone or a tablet, just on mute so that you can easily type in some comments to the chat room. Participation just makes this so much more fun rather than me just speaking to a camera for um, with, with no interaction. So I want to hear your comments about the wine. I want to hear your questions. I want to hear your thoughts on rosé and your experiences with these wines that we're about to taste. So thanks so much for tuning in and watching us from Norfolk. Wonderful, so excited, um, especially, sorry, side note, so excited to try this wine with you guys just because this wine always makes me think of you, Lonnie and Kita, especially because um, y'all love this Spanish wine so much. So Chris and Mary, thank y'all so much for tuning in. I feel like I literally just saw most of you um, just a couple hours ago, either myself or some mom um, delivering these wines. So i um, super excited just to be able to participate a little bit more. Um, um, some um, some bro and some sis alive in Suffolk there right across the table from me. Um, family vacation has um, overflowed from last week into this week and I'm super excited to um, be sharing these wines with my family as well. Um, hi Robert uh, from Williamsburg, great to see you guys. Um, all right, so if you're not participating in the chat room, totally fine. Um, enjoy the class, tell me what you think afterwards. Um, but the chat room is really helpful for me to just hear your thoughts on the wine. Um, wine to me is super special because it brings people together and it allows us all to learn from each other. And we do that best when we hear what these thoughts are online. When I hear what you think about the wine um, and you hear what I think about the wine and we all learn from each other. So Chat room is great um, if you want to participate. Um, I didn't mean that to run, but it did, and now I'm okay with that. So, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I love it. I got a shout out. Yes, you're forever shouted out now on the internet. So, um, all right, so just as a means of setup, make sure that everybody has two wine glasses. Um, your wine should all have tags on them. Um, each wine should have a tag that says, what number in order it comes from and how we're going to serve it. So we're gonna serve it in two rounds, two wines. Um, the first two are kind of like the fresher, fruitier, brighter style. And then we get into like the more savory, weirder, funkier style of rosé. The goal though is that none of these rosés should taste like rosé that you normally order a glass of when you go to a restaurant. Um, if to, does anyone remember ordering rosé at a restaurant? Like, when was the last time anyone was able to go to a restaurant and order rosé? If you remember, you know, years back, uh, months back, when we could just go to a restaurant and have rosé for brunch, um, then you remember the type of rosé. It's light, it's fresh, it's fruity, it's easy drinking, food friendly, crushable, uh, chuggable are the words that I like to use. Um, the four rosés that we're going to taste today are a little bit outside of that box. Um, so, super, super excited. Hey, Lori, uh, coming from Norfolk. Awesome. You're more to use them. You are also more than welcome to not use them. Um, so, if you want to be super analytical and really get into the down and dirty of uh, analyzing each of these wines and getting into the tasting notes, use these as much as you like. This is gonna be a little bit more of a 
Uh, there's some history class and then there's just also like just a stylistic class. Um, so we're just really going to be talking about the styles of rosé. Um, so um, I won't be going through every single wine, all of these um, uh, tasting analytical notes. If you want to use them though, feel free, by all means, do so. So we're going to go ahead and start with um, Beth and Don. Awesome. We're not starting with y'all. I just um, interrupted my sentence to say hello to you, Beth and Don. So since I saw y'all too, did. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with the of the two days. Number one should be this Dom Diogo uh, from Portugal. Um, I've got a screw cap. Um, I've got these nifty foil. If you've never seen these and you want to know why I always use them, here's why. These little foil capsules, uh, not capsules, discs, they curl up really easily and I stick them in the neck of the bottle and it just allows for a super easy pour without the drip down the neck of the bottle that always happens when I'm distracted and I'm doing 20 things at once and I'm pouring wine for 20 people. Um, so that's that's what I'm using. Um, and it's just a disc and I just rinse it off and keep you reusing those. So this is wine number one. We're gonna serve this on the glass on your left. So just like we read left to right, we are going to taste left to right. So go ahead and pour yourself, you know, three, four, eight ounces, doesn't matter, of um, wine number one. Wine number two is this funky bottle. Um, the producer is Emma's Toy, it's called Rubentis, and it also has a screw cap on it as well. And it is from Spain, from the Basque country of Spain, from the area of Getriaco Chacolina. So pour yourself a few ounces of each of those. You can go ahead and open, the other two wines have corks. Um, you can go ahead and open those, just keep them in the fridge though, no reason for them to get up to um, room temperature. These wines are best enjoyed chilled. Um, so, um, awesome. All right, super cool. Here's how I want the class to go. Um, we're gonna taste the wine, we're gonna enjoy them. Go ahead, you can go ahead and start sipping on both of these. I'm gonna give kind of a brief history of rosé and what rosé wine is all about. And then we're gonna get into the details about each of them. Um, and great question, Anna. Um, yes, Chacolina is the actual area in Basque country, Spain. So on the northern corner of Spain, like as it goes into France. Um, so yes, all Chacolina wine is indicative of the area, Getariaco Chocolina, which is in the Basque country of Spain. So yes, they're all Spanish. So we've got a Portuguese to the left, a Spanish to the right, very different color, so you shouldn't get the wines mixed up. Um, Sam, brother, would you mind putting these two wines in the refrigerator? Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, all right, so go ahead, sniff swirl, smell, taste these two wines, and I'm just going to give you a brief history of rosé and what we're talking about. So basically, most people have just now in the last 40 years started hearing about, thinking about, and tasting rosé, whether it is the dry rosé style or it's the blush style. And let me, let me break down the difference between the two. Dry rosé is literally that. It's dry. It's not sweet. It is a pink wine that is not sweet. It could come from anywhere. It could be made from any grape. But it is dry. It's refreshing. It's bright. It's crisp. It's usually made from red grapes or a blend of red and white grapes. And that's it. Um, blush wine is like your white Zinfandels, your white Merlots. Um, and this was basically invented in the very late 70s by Sutter Holm um, in Napa. And it was a way for them to use the extra juice from their Zinfandel grapes. It was called a bleed, it's, it's, it's a bleed off basically. They, they used um, 
So they're making their Zinfandel, which is a red grape, and they're making their higher end Zinfandels. To extra concentrate their Zinfandel, they would press off some immediate, like more watery juice of the grapes at the very beginning to further concentrate the juice that they're gonna ferment and uh, create into their red wine. And that bleed off juice became rose, and they, it was a blush rose, and they added sugar to it, and they kept it super, super sweet, and they called it white Zinfandel. It was pink. White Zinfandel has never been white, ironically. Um, but it was always very, very sweet and a means to use basically extra juice that they should just throw down the drain or that they would have just thrown down the drain to further concentrate their higher-end red Zinfandels. Well, this became extremely popular in the 80s, um, 1980s, and literally put Sutter Home in the map. Blush wines that they were making put Sutter Home on the map and kind of changed the course of uh, pink wine history. Um, really, really interesting. I remember back when I first started serving and waiting tables and people would order a Zinfandel and I would bring them a glass of red wine and they'd be like, I'm sorry, I thought Zinfandel was pink, but it's called white Zinfandel. I'm like, oh yeah, totally different. And so Americans' perception of what Zinfandel is, what rosé is, and what white Zinfandel is are all shaped basically by Sutter Holmes' um, ingenious idea of uh, using bleed off juice from their Zinfandel pressings to make this sweet, crushable, um, chuggable um, pink wine. But it did change how Americans think about rose. Rose, that blush wine, rose is dry. Um, it's either 98% dry or 100% dry every time unless it's not, um, is how I like to say it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, just, to, just to make things more confusing for you, because that's what I like to do is, um, here's the rule and here's how it doesn't apply in all of these different situations. So that's blush wine. We're not tasting any of those. I don't feature those. You can go buy them if you want to enjoy yourself if you want to, but that's not what we're featuring in these classes. So all of these wines are dry rosé. And dry rosé, while it became popular, I'd say mid-century, 1900s, um, it became astronomically, insanely popular in the last 20 years, um, where these phrases and hashtags, rosé all day, the name of this class, or yes way rosé, or all of these phrases about like a rosé lifestyle, <laughs> um, seeing the world through rosé colored glasses, Rosé became indicative of kind of an American lifestyle, of the spring and summer lifestyle, um, in the same way that um, Corona and Lime goes together and Gin and Tonic goes together. It very much just like Rosé was its own thing and it, and it blew up in terms of popularity, especially with social media in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, however, Rosé actually has its origins dating back to the 6th century BC. So 6th century BC, they are the in the Mediterranean, um, along the Mediterranean coast of France, the Phoenicians are planting grapes up along the, um, the Rhone River as they are trading. They're planting white and red grapes, and it usually became like this hodgepodge mix between the two. So it was like this very pale, about this color, um, pink wine. And um, it was fresh and fruity and light and really delicious and safer to drink than water. So it became like this, this thing that people started talking about, the pink wine of the Mediterranean. Um, and since then, um, which you know has been many centuries because that was 6th century BCE, it has developed in a very long history in Provence, France, which is along the southern Mediterranean coast of France, really picked up the reins and kind of name like made their namesake to be rosé and specifically dry rosé and um, specifically pink wine as their reputation. So most places that make rosé wine, we're tasting wine from um, Portugal and Spain now, we're going to be tasting California later, everywhere that makes wine makes rosé wine. But all of those areas, their reputation is actually white wine or red wine or sparkling wine and rosé is kind of a subset like it's a 
um, uh, what, the stepsister. Is that the phrase, right? The stepsister. Um, like it's it's not it's it's not their reputation. It's just something they do on the side to make a little extra money because rosé is really popular. Provence, France operates very differently. That is their reputation. And then they make red wine and sparkling on the side as the stepsister. So it's the one area in the entire world that actually has their reputation based and founded on rosé wine um, since the 6th century BCE. So um, super fascinating history and it's gone a long ways. And basically, what's amazing is that rosé wine is made in multiple different um, styles, multiple different ways, meant for multiple occasions. Sometimes it's meant to be drunk super fresh and young and don't age it at all. Sometimes it's meant to be aged. And we're going to get into a bunch of those different styles here. So now I need a glass of rosé. Uh, Luckily, I've got two. Um, so let's let's hold up your glass number one, and I'm and you're already sipping and enjoying, hopefully. Um, but we're going to get into a little bit more of these specifics of the wine. If you actually hold up both, um, I just love the color variances of rosé. Most people think just rosé is pink. No, um, there's actually so many different ranges um, and if you hold the wines both on the side even in the camera you can see how different they are both on the side with a white piece of paper in the background um, you're going to look down through the wine above the wine you're going to look through it and you want the wine glasses to above the paper and notice what we're looking for is the concentration and the color. Here's where we really get to see the color. So on the left, you see this like, it's got these like ruby hints to it, um, almost like magenta, fuchsia, like um, brilliant salmon, like the salmon that is like colored in the grocery store, you know, where they add like the salmon dye to it. That's the color of uh, the wine on the left with these like ruby, pink, fuchsia, magenta hues. The wine on the left though, is more like tangerine or peach slightly orange uh, tinged um, coloring to it. A little bit of pink, but it's definitely more on the peach side versus the first one is more on the pink side. So drastically different colors on these wines. For clarity, what we're looking for, if you hold it up to the light, your glasses, um, wow. For the first time ever, I swirled wine in my left hand and it didn't spill. So <laughs> something's <laughs> going right here. <laughs> um, so what we're looking for is how the, there we go, it, it's, it's over now. My good luck is over. <laughs> um, you're looking for how the light is reflected through each of the wines. And so both of these wines are reflecting the light brilliantly. I'd say probably the wine on the left though has a little bit more almost like star bright brilliancy to it versus the wine on the left is bright but not necessarily what the psalm world would call star bright. Um, so um, not that it matters and how it tastes but that's just part of the fun of analyzing the wine. The concentration in terms of coloring um, um, both of these are, are pretty pale in concentration. I'd say the, the first one would be maybe a three. The second wine would be about a one and a half or so in terms of concentration. And the last thing we're looking at um, are the legs. And if you notice, actually, both of these wines have a bit of um, um, evidence of gas. So a um, um, little bit of these tiny bubbles that are forming on the inside of the glass. Um, and so there is a little bit of spritz to both of these wines, interestingly enough, and we'll talk about why that is in a second. Um, it looks like sand particles or something in your glass, but it's actually gas that's dissolved into the wine that's, that's showing up in these little like spritzy bubbles. So, um, yes, awesome. So the one on the right, the wine on the right is sheeting, um, um, that term that we learned in the, in the, in the last class. So if you swirl the wine, the wine's going to coat the inside of the glass. It's going to form these legs or teardrops, and they're going to drip down and, and, and fall down the inside of the glass. 
Sheeting is when the whole rim kind of breaks apart like Windex, where it doesn't all come down solidly, where it just kind of breaks apart. And I'm definitely getting that um, in, for me, both of my wine glasses are, are showing a little bit of sheeting. And the legs just tell us alcohol percentage. So the thicker the legs are, the slower they are to form and fall, the higher the alcohol content. So alcohol increases viscosity, makes those legs form slower, thicker, more defined. Rosé, you're looking at like kind of a max of like 13.5% alcohol. I have certainly had some rosés higher than that. I prefer not to drink those. Um, let me see, actually, as I say that, I should check and see. All right, so first wine, wine number one, 12%. Okay, we good, we good. Um, second wine, 11%. Sometimes I'm like, I definitely don't like wine at this percentage alcohol. And then I'm like, this is delicious. And it's, it's that percentage alcohol. So just wanted to make sure I was clarifying. Um, all right, so those are the legs. Now let's get into the smell. Here's where I need you in the chat room to tell me what you are smelling. Um, I like to go back and forth between one and two. Um, wow, so different. Um, I mean, I, I know what these wines taste like because I've, I picked them all for the class, but I haven't actually had them side by side and I just did it by my nose is kind of in shock from tasting these two wines side by side. Um, tell me what you are smelling in each of these wines. Is one of them more intense than the other? Is one of them more fruit forward than the other? Are you getting something weird and not fruity on either of these wines? So, um, um, Lonnie, will you clarify? I thought it was mostly a seasonal what? I need a, I, I'm, I'm putting a dot, dot, dot on that. If you clarify that, I will answer a question for sure. Um, both have some strawberry in it and definitely lighter on the number two. Awesome. Love, love, love that. Yes. Um, rosé tends to be on the red and pink fruited side of things. So you often get, um, strawberry, cherry, raspberry, watermelon, the pink lighter side, but sometimes you can get some more intense red fruit or even some black fruit on there. And sometimes you get a lot more citrus or, um, or herbaceousness um, to your wines that all just changed based on um, the wine and, and, the, and the style. Wine number one, this very intense straw, like the strawberry candies. Yeah. Oh my word. Yeah. The strawberry candies that have like the, the green foil wrapper and that they're juicy on the inside that grandma's always have in a glass bowl and they're on their, um, you know, their end table, but no one has ever seen them in a store ever. And no one knows where you can buy them from. Yes. Those candies. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, number one, ripe peaches and gravel. Yeah. I love that minerality call. And we're going to talk about why that is, um, in this, and this particular wine uh, shortly. Great call on that on that minerality and gravel. Um, wine number two, a little bit more shy, yeah, with hints of grapefruit. Love that, yes, it's so, 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 so citrusy. Green pepper, yes. I mean, it's to me, it's like straight up jalapeno, um, like smelling a fresh jalapeno and it's pepper, spicy green pepper, not just like sweet green bell pepper. Um, great call on that. Yes. And so, yes, all that strawberry with that peppery herbaceous, um, brightness on the, uh, on the back end. Yeah. Number one is a punch on the nose. Yeah. Um, it ain't shy, right? Like it's all up in your face. It's the kind of person that you're walking down the grocery store aisle and you hear the person the next aisle over, they're talking on their phone and you know, by the time you get to the end of the aisle and actually meet them, what they look like because they're so just loud as a human being. Um, yeah, that's that wine. Um, <laughs> um, number two, way less intense, a little bit more watermelon. Yeah, okay, love the watermelon call. And to me, the melon notes on the second wine are like the sour, acidic, bitter part of the melon, like when you bite too close into the rind. Um, 
those like greener, more bitter notes um, of that one. So cantaloupe on number one. Okay, cool. Yes. Yeah. So you got all this like fresh fruitiness on the first one and you get a little bit more of the bitterness and savoriness on the second one. Still similar fruit, different parts of the fruit on each of these wines, which is why I wanted to feature them side by side. Um, seasonal wine. Okay. Yes. So yes. So rosé is seasonal. Part of the reason it's seasonal though is just because of its marketing, not because rosé is seasonal, but because it's released in the spring. And so it goes along with spring and summer food. But one of my favorite meals in the world to pair with rosé is Thanksgiving actually. So ham and turkey pair so well with Thanksgiving. Some of these like richer, more savory dishes in the winter time, when you're not necessarily wanting a white wine, but you're not necessarily wanting a red wine, rosé is perfect for. So it definitely became marketed as a very seasonal thing, but I don't think we should ever limit rosé to being one specific season. Um, drink it all year long, all day long, all year long. Um, uh, I love it. You thought you were crazy for smelling jalapeno. No, here's, and this is my, this is my mission statement for all of you who've known me for a long enough time. Own your own palate, like trust your own palate. If you smell something and think that's too weird to say out loud, that's probably the thing I'm looking for in terms of a tasting note. So the weirder, the better, be weird, smell weird things in your wine and tell me what things those are. So um, awesome. All right, so as we taste them, we can, if you, again, if you want to go through each of the different steps, perfectly fine. Um, I basically want to categorize each of these four wines into different personalities and different situations. So is one of these wines more of a picnic wine? Is one of these wines more of a um, brunch rosé? Is one of these wines more of like a, I want to sit down and this is like my main course for dinner and this is the wine I'm going to pair it. Um, is it by the pool? Is it by the beach? How are you enjoying this rosé? Think about the personality overall. So go through all the steps if you want to, but I'm really going to focus more on kind of like the overall conclusion. Um, and man, I, I, I'm so excited to taste these wines. Um, I know everyone's already into the tasting part of things. <laughs> I'm far behind, but all right. So I'm tasting wine number one, the Dom Diogo. The great is Padeiro. Um, Portuguese, it's like you have to pronounce every letter and draw it out, it's odd. Um, and the region is Vino Verde. So most people think of Vino Verde as a style of wine, not a region, because it became marketed basically in the last 15 years to the US as a slightly spritzy, slightly sweet, less than 9% alcohol content white wine that's just perfect chuggable by the pool wine. That's how they marketed Vino Verde, but Vino Verde is a whole region. So you have red wine from Vino Verde, you have rosé, you have more serious white wine from um, Vino Verde, and it's within the larger region of Minho, M-I-N-H-O. And we're in the mountains, we're further inland where you have lots of rain, cool nights, cool days, so you get these like bright, acidic, tart wines um, that if you pick them young, meaning green, the grapes are still a little bit more green, um, you get this like fresh, vibrant, spritzy kind of wine. Um, but you can actually make pretty serious wine from this region. So don't see Vino Verde and just automatically assume it's gonna be one style. This grape, Padero, is, um, there's only a few red grapes that actually are red on the inside once you peel off the skin, and this is one of those grapes. So thus, the color of this wine is so much more like pungently, deeply concentrated. Um, all right. Yeah, I'm not gonna spit that, that's delicious. <laughs> um, whoo, all right. Does everyone get that little bit of spritz? Like my mouth is watering. It's super refreshing. While the fruit is kind of a little bit dense and kind of coats my tongue, it's still so refreshing and vibrant, um, almost like flamboyant. This is like pink flamingo wine. Um, it has the personality of a flamingo, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, super vibrant, vivacious salsa, but like the dance salsa. Um, whew, super, super, super delicious. 
not overly complex and not meant to be. Meant to be simple and super enjoyable. Let's try wine number two, and then y'all tell me what you think about the taste profile between one and two. Man, I just can't get past the jalapeno notes on wine number two now. The more, the more it's opening up. <laughs> yes. Some mom for the win there. She says higher acid and oh my word. Yeah, my, my eyes are watering. Um, <laughs> and so spicy. It's like jalapeno and white pepper just in a glass with white cranberry juice, um, but not the sweetened kind. It's like if Ocean Spray made white cranberry juice but added zero sugar, and you poured that over top of a watermelon rind that you had eaten all the good <laughs> fruit off of, and you charred it with some jalapeno peppers and spritz some white pepper on top, and you just drink that all from the melon rind. Yeah, I can't imagine wanting to do that thing, but um, this wine is something that I want to drink more of. Um, so Anna says we're making a drinking game with the word chuckable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes, so here's the problem. Rosé classes, I'm gonna say chuckable a whole lot. I just said it again, so take a sip. Um, so, uh, so maybe you should call out of work now, because now that you've told me that you're doing this game, Game on, Anna. <laughs> um, yes, Turkey Day and Rosé. Love it, love it, love it. Um, Dewana says, wine number one, not complex in flavor. Absolutely the truth. Uh, I definitely see this paired more with brunch earlier in the day. Yeah, um, like breakfast? Yeah. Why even call it brunch? Like, this is just your breakfast wine. This is like, absolutely. Um, I really want to enjoy it with a southwestern type of um, salad with corn, grilled chicken, avocado romaine, etc. Yes. So wine number one, because it's more of that fruit forward style too, would also really work with a little bit of a spicier flavored um, dish. So shrimp and grits, if you're on the brunch category. In the lunch category, yes, tacos, southwest style salads, um, dinner time. Um, yeah, you, you, you think of um, like some blackened grilled chicken off of the grill, something like that. Something with a little bit of heat to it is often difficult to pair with wine because the acidity in wine just accentuates the heat. If it doesn't have fruit that kind of rounds it out, um, it can be hard to pair wine with some of those dishes. But this rosé, wine number one, would be perfect. Now, wine number two is already spicy, right? with very, very accentuated acidity. So if you pair wine number two with those same dishes, those spicier dishes, you're gonna turn into a dragon. You're just gonna be breathing fire um, from your <laughs> mouth. It's gonna <laughs> accentuate the spice level that much. So if you enjoy that experience in your life, by all means, <laughs> do that. Uh, you do you. <laughs> but um, I suggest that when you have spicier wines with higher acidity, like wine number two, you pair them with something creamier. So think pasta carbonara, um, that, that bacon, that creamier dish, um, chilled orzo salads with that olive you know, and feta in there, um, something a little bit richer for that acidity to cut through rather than accentuate the spice, it kind of mitigates some things. So um, yes. Uh, wine number one on a cloudy, breezy beach day. Yeah. Um, before you, like, it, it's only going to be like 20 minutes and you're going to be trying to find that second bottle. So um, um, watch out. Those cloudy days are, um, are scandalously deceptive. Um, all right. So here's, so we talked a little bit about uh, Vino Verde, the region um, in Minho, Portugal. Um I should have brought this over. Um, this area um, in the Basque country of Spain is on the north coast of Spain. Like, so you have all these mountains that like kind of fade into the northern Atlantic Ocean um, of Spain. And in this area, they like to pour wine from what's called a porron, which is basically, it looks like a tea kettle, but it's made out of glass. It has this like long, thin spout. And you squirt 
straight in. I actually did that on live camera of, of like many videos ago. I should have brought it over. I, I totally forgot. It was a little bit of an insane day. But um, that's how they classically pour these wines in this area from. And every September they have a chocolate fest. So the region, which if you see right on the top, TXA. K-O-L-I-N-A, Chocolina is how it's pronounced, like chocolate, um, Chocolina. And wine from this area is called Chocoli. Um, you can have red, you can have white, you can have rosé. Um, this grape is called Honduribi Beltza. It's the red grape of the region. Um, the other classic white grape of the region is called Honduribi Zuri. Um, you know if you're going to attend one of my virtual classes, I'm going to throw some weird-ass grapes at yeah, so uh, Honduras Belza is the red grape, um, and often it's blended um, with white grape, or it can be made into rosé or red wine. Um, but generally speaking, they're always going to have a little bit of this spritz to it. And if you're interested to see a red wine from this region, I have a red wine by this producer, Emma Stoy. It's called Stimatum, and it's a slightly spritzy red wine that I like to serve chilled, and it's like the perfect summer red wine. I only have one case left of this, and then it's just gone. Like, that's, that, that's it. So if you're interested, uh, let me know, and I can put it in your next six-pack order. Um, but what they do for both of these wines is they do inject a little bit of carbon dioxide into each bottle before they put the screw cap on because they want it to have that slight spritz, that, that, that vibrancy, that, that um, dance on your tongue kind of uh, reaction. So very, very common. Sometimes you just have a slight spritz in wine because it was bottled really young and you're opening it within six months of it being bottled. They actually inject carbon dioxide just you know, a couple pumps, it's, you know, um, just, just to give it that, that spritz. Um, so both of these wines do have injected carbon dioxide into it. I wanted to feature these wines side by side to show different levels of bigger bubbles, kind of more in your face and that real tight kind of slice your tongue bubbles, um, of the second wine right there. So between the two, obviously very different. But there are some serious similarities. Um, do you have a preference between the two? Like if, if, if uh, the Rosé Fairy Godmother is going to gift you a case of one of these wines uh, for you to drink over the summertime, which one would you choose if you could only choose one um, and why? So tell me that. I'm going to go ahead and grab the next two wines just so they, so I can make sure that they're, they're good um, while I, I um, oh, no, nope, Sam Mom's already doing it. Fabulous. Um, so, Sam Brother, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on you since you're right across the table from me. Of the two, which one would you pick? Uh, 100% number one. Number one. Okay, why? So, Sam Brother says number one for the win. Why? Uh, it's easier. I don't have to think about it as much. Um, the, the, the less complexity is something I'd like to okay. say. Fabulous. So some brother says um, it's easier to drink. There's there's less complexity. There's less like intellectual requirement for this. And, and that's what he wants in a rosé. He wants it easy, simple, easy to approach, easy to drink. So, um, yeah, that's why I love wine number one as well. So do you have a preference then? One, for sure. One? Okay. Why? Yeah. Um, well, whoever said the strawberry candy... That, wow, that just did it for me. Awesome. I actually hate that strawberry candy, but for some reason it was a good. And when you said jalapeno, I, I actually love jalapeno, so it was weird that I don't want strawberry yeah. candy. I love jalapeno. I definitely would put okay. wine number one. So sister-in-law says that she also prefers wine number one, even though she loves jalapeno, she was surprised, and she doesn't like those strawberry candies. She was surprised she liked number one more than she did. I mean, as much as she did um, and more than the other one. So that's so interesting about wine is, you know, I could love a certain fruit or um, a certain smell, but just because a wine has characteristics of that fruit and smell doesn't mean that you're going to, like, fall in love with that wine. So, um, and, and to me, when we're just drinking these wines by themselves, wine number one is just easier to drink by itself, right? Wine number two needs some food. I need some tacos. I need some chips and queso. I need something for that acidity and intensity 
to kind of hold on to. So if I were drinking wine with chips and queso, I'd want wine number two. If I'm drinking by itself, yeah, wine number one is, is delicious. So Bob Scanlon says number two, awesome. Um, let's see, um, Best Miss says we're only tasting number one tonight. Okay, fabulous. That's the great thing about these videos is you can keep watching them and not taste the wine or you can like stop the video and watch the recording later and taste the rest of the wines later. So, um, um, James, number two was one of the more interesting wines I've tasted. Love it. Okay. Awesome. And sometimes more interesting means we don't necessarily like it as much. Sometimes it means we like it more. It's, it's, it's interesting how interesting that is. Uh, <laughs> I right, thought that's, that's the end of my cheesy jokes. Probably not, but we'll try. Um, <laughs> Um, um, Sam, mom, what do you, what, what was your favorite? 8.30, oh, no food, number one. 8.30 a.m. or 8.30 p.m.? P.m. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam, mom says 8.30 by the pool, no food, number one. And I had to clarify to make sure which, which, if she meant 8.30 a.m. or p.m. She says p.m. Um, all right, so number two, situation? Pre-dinner, 5 p.m., cheese and crackers. Okay, so she wants the second wine the from Chuckley, um, pre-dinner with cheese and crackers, something a little bit more formal and, um, and get your palate revving. And yeah, you need, you need that cheese. Um, I love it. Tawana says, why choose? Correct. Absolutely, Tawana, just as a means of conversation. Um, but yes, you don't have to choose because there's plenty of both of these wines available. Um, so you actually prefer number two. Awesome. If I twisted your arm. So okay. um, Anna, I prefer number one and may need to order more if available. Absolutely. Both of these wines will be available for quite some time. Um, Beth is in for number one, two. Number one, easy. I mean, sorry, number one as well, not two, the number. Um, all right, cool. We're we're like split half and half in terms of um, of each of these wines. Um, hopefully, you liked them both and just could see how they would be appreciated in different circumstances. Um, and if you are interested, I also sell the perons, the um, the glass tea kettle things that. Literally, the, the, the history is you just like pass around the perron and everyone just like pours it straight into their mouth. And then you do this thing where you like draw out the pouring. And so you pour it from, you know, six feet away from the glass or straight into someone's mouth. People stand on tables and on ladders and pour into people's mouths or in glasses. It's this whole production in this area. Um, I cannot believe I forgot to bring a perron over here to demonstrate that. But if you're interested in more of that, happy to deliver a pron to you and give you a whole demonstration. Um, okay. Well, let's try the next two roses. Um, not really eager to get rid of these. So I might just pour them in other glasses. That one out. <laughs> oh man. Just so good. All right. So, Next glasses. This is why I always bring over like 25 glasses to these events. Wine number one is Idlewild, this uh, funky black and white with the, with the peach uh, lettering from Mendocino County, California. This is a blend of Dolcetto, Barbera, and Nebbiolo and is made in a very, very different style in terms of how they make rosé. So we're going to get into the next part of the lesson will be a little bit more instead of the history of rosé the different winemaking styles of rosé. So go ahead and pour uh, a few ounces or the whole bottle, I don't care, um, into your glass of each of these wines. Wine on the left should be Idlewild. Wine on the right should be this Clausibon um, Tiborin rosé is the name of the great Tiborin. Um, so this is wine on the right. Again, very different colors on both of these wines, so you should not have trouble keeping your glasses uh, separated on. Oh my word, what? Like, this isn't even rosé, it's just orange. Um, ah, that's so cool. All right, yeah, it's just like yellow or orange wine. It's, it's, it's not pink at all. Um, I love people who just do things differently, march to the beat of their own drum. So let's talk about coloring real quickly. 
color from rosé comes just from the skin of the grape. Um, like we talked about when we talked about the Portuguese uh, grape, the Paideiro. Um, this is one of the few grapes that is actually red on the inside as well. The juice, the, the flesh of the grape is red on the inside. You peel off, and it's like one of like six grapes that are like that. You peel off the skin of the grape of any other red grape, and it looks the exact same on the inside as a white grape. So the coloring from red wine only comes from the skin of the grape. And that happens over a long period of time, not a long, but long-ish period of time. So the grapes get picked, they get brought into the winery, and they get processed. So the bad grapes get thrown out along with the earwigs because earwigs love grape clusters. After my um, trip to Oregon last year, um, working harvest, I learned that firsthand. So that's part of the picking process is you're throwing out the bugs and the spiders and the earwigs as well. Um, so you throw out the bad grapes and keep the good ones. They either get de-stemmed, so the grapes get taken away from the cluster, the stem of the grape cluster, or they go in as a whole cluster, depending on what the winemaker wants to do. And then those grapes get put into a big vat, and either they get um, pressed down with um, manual presses, um, where it basically looks like a metal plate with a pole on it. So I'm gonna push down the grapes on the top to kind of crush the grapes, or you do what's called pijage, and that's where you literally get into the tanks as a human being and stomp the grapes. And this is not like I Love Lucy where the grapes are six inches deep. This is, you know, five and a half feet deep of grapes and you're holding yourself up on the edge of the tank, crushing the grapes. That's when you start seeing the color of the grape skins themselves influence the juice. So in order to more from the grape skins, you're going to keep the wine at a really cold temperature to prevent fermentation from spontaneously happening. So about 40 degrees. After 43, yeast starts fermenting. So if you keep it colder than 40, then it's not going to ferment the wine. And instead, that's just going to allow this slow process of extraction of the color, the flavoring, the tannin, and the, the, the chemical um, grip of the wine from the skins themselves. That's called a cold stabilization process or a cold maceration or a cold soak. Um, anyway, it has to be cold and it's usually between three to seven days that a wine will do um, this cold soak to really soak through um, the, the skins of the grapes and, and, and bleed the color, the flavor, and the, and the chemical. For rosé, you can either do uh, one of three things to make rosé and to make that pink color. You can either um, only allow the skin of the grapes to interact with the juice for a matter of hours. That's how 99% of rosé is made. So whether it's three hours, whether it's 24 hours, somewhere in between, um, and it all depends on the grape itself and the style that you're going to make. And then, you, and then you press the juice off the skins immediately um, or after however many hours you have designated. So that's going to give some coloring or tint to the wine. So you do have some of those tannins, some of that bitterness, some of that chemical grip to the wine, and some of the pigment as well from the skins. That is how most rosé is made. You can also do what we talked about when we talked about the history of Sutter Hall making white Zinfandel, and that's where the bleed off, where basically you're soaking the wine, and then over a period of time, you keep bleeding off kind of like the extra juice, and that juice is just like a lighter style of red wine. Um, so rather than pressing it off immediately, you're just taking a free run juice, bleeding that off to further concentrate the product that you're trying to make. Um, that's, that's, that's few and far between. Some people do that, but you're definitely going to get a more savory style, richer, less acidic, less vibrant style of rosé when you make it like that. Um, the third way you can make rosé, which is super rare, which we are tasting in um, this wine in uh, the Idlewild glass, is a co-fermentation process where you're actually just fermenting the wine at a different temperature um, and you're fermenting it with white wine. Um, this wine is uh, fermented with our nace, and you're co-fermenting the red wine and the white wine together to make a very light style rosé colored wine, but it's fully fermented instead of bled off um, or, or pressed off um, the juice. So 
very different styles of making rosé. And um, uh, the first one, uh, we do have the three red grapes, which are listed on your tag, Nebbiolo, Dolcetto, and Barbera red grapes, and then the co-fermented with white grapes. So really interesting. Um, and the next wine um, is from Provence, France. So like the classic home, the birthplace of, of rosé, um, but made in a very different style. So typically Provence rosé is made from Grenache, Syrah, Senso, Mouvedra, all of these grapes that are classically grown in this region. Um, and, and basically they, they just pick the grapes that didn't make the cut for the higher end red wines and they're making a, a fresh, vibrant, food friendly, acidic, bright style of rosé wine meant for all the seafood fare that you're going to eat during the um, um, summer. This grape though is called Tiburin. So Tiburin right there is the name of the grape itself. And were it not for this producer, Closibum, this grape would have gone extinct. So um, everyone was ripping up Tiburin and planting the more classic Provence style um, uh, rosé grapes, Grenache, Shiraz, Mouvedre, and so. And um, the last vineyards that existed on the entire planet of Tiburin were in their vineyards and they decided not to rip them up. They're like, we think that there's something special about this grape. So they kept growing them, and um, these grapes are now, these vines are seventy plus years old now, and they're going to continue planting them. And other people have started since then replanting Tiburin because they realize that it does have some unique qualities to it. So this is hundred percent Tiburin instead of a typical Provencal um, rosé blend. This is um, a very savory, oak aged, masculine style of rosé um, on the on the on the right. So. Let's get into the smell of these wines. Um, hopefully y'all are already, oh my word, what? There's kind of this like onslaught of weirdness uh, in my nose. <laughs> Which one is nutty? Number one. Number one, okay, yeah, because um, it's 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 co-fermented these red grapes and white grapes instead of being this um, um, made as a, a typical rosé style. So yes, so we're gonna get so we had fresh and fruity, um, we had spicy um, as the two styles of our first wines, and, and now we're gonna get nutty and creamy, um, and then savory and herbaceous. Um, hopefully, is is. It's the kind of great jam and nail polish remover. Are we crazy? <laughs> um, wine to River Rocks. Okay. Um, yeah. I need to. Um, wine number one is just so. It's like Smarties. Ah, oh, it's Smarties, M says. Um, nail polish remover, I can see that. Um, that should blow off. If you, if you ever get that, sometimes it's just the sulfur dioxide that. Or, or wine that was made um, really reductively, um, meaning no oxygen influence. Um, so sometimes that will blow off that nail polish remover. So if you if you swirl it around real well and then blow into your glass, kind of pushes some of those like chemical interactions out of your mouth, out of, out of the glass. And um, there is something real funky about this wine like the Idlewild because it's been, she's talked about this rosé for so many years. It's been one of our favorites, but mm -hmm. Idlewild is definitely a more natural um, producer, um, very uninterventionalist. So every vintage is going to taste pretty darn different because they let the vintage speak for itself. So sometimes you get crisp and clean. Sometimes you get rich and nutty. Sometimes you get funky and masculine and leathery. Um, all of their wines um, change so much. I'm definitely getting more like, candied melon notes on, um, on it now as, a, as I keep swirling it. So um, Tawana says, I love the Smarties comparison. Awesome. Even when I was pouring, I was getting the sweet smell, but I kept thinking cereal. Oh, man, I like that call. Yeah, like fruity pebbles. Um, Lucky Charms, kind of that <laughs> chalky, fruity, fake fake fruit kind of thing that 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 candy that um synthetic fruit flavor i promise you they're not putting synthetic fruit flavors into the wine at all um oh just 
Yeah, um, it's it is a little heady. I'm getting that um, that alcohol pop. Um, we're only at 11.9 percent on the Idlewild Rosé. Um, for the um, uh, close bone, we're at 13.5. So to me, again, to go back, I'm glad glad I didn't contradict myself. 13.5 is kind of like the max that I want my alcohol to be in my rosé wine because. Um, <sighs> Oh my word. The second wine, um, the Closey Bone, hardly hardly smells like fruit at all. Instead, it smells like vanilla cream pie, like banana cream pie and um and like um sawdust. Um nice. All right, cool. So I'm not crazy. Good. Well. That's debatable. <laughs> Probably not debatable. I am crazy. Um, <laughs> all right, go ahead and um, and 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 we've noticed these colors too. Um, hopefully, um, the the first one is definitely like peachy, but still on that a little bit more on that orange tinge coloring rather than um, pink rosé. And that uh, wine number two is just straight up golden um, peach skin color. So um, uh, go ahead and taste these. Tell me what you're getting in terms of perception, in terms of style, in terms of um, complexity of these wines, situations that you can enjoy them. Mmm. Cool. That is that that Idlewild is just unreal. It is mm -hmm. it is unlike any any rose I've ever tried. Um, sweet meat, sweet meat. I love that. Yes, um, it's Polynesia. Polynesia. Okay, like cinnamon flavored. Like you know, have, you have some like Greek meats. Mm -hmm. They have like the falafel with some cinnamon, some curry notes, or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, there is there is some abidiness. And this like sweet, rich, nutty um, caramelization um, to that um, that first wine. Wow. Um, wine number two. Mm. My number two is is so savory. There's like zero fruit in there at all. It's just like masculine and mean almost. Not mean in terms of acidity, just it's just a little rough around the edges and and, and masculine, savory. Um, very, very different style than your tutti frutti rosés and starbursts and candy and watermelon. Um, it's like the ocean. Salty, yeah, yeah, a little salty, a little briny on that on that next one, like um, green olives, not like black olives, not Kalamata olives, definitely like this green olive note on that um, that Tibor and Rosé. Um, Kita said number two is wet plants and wet tobacco, uh, tobacco call, almost like you're going to light a pipe and um, the tobacco is a little bit damp and so you just get like this smoky note to it. Um, I, I've never actually done that, but I, that's what I'm imagining. Um, and yeah, this uh, like sweet herbs kind of thing, um, but a little dank at the same time. Number one seems to be a neutral one that could pair with most anything. Yeah. And and to me, that's that's the key is that it, it can pair with a lot of things, but it needs to be paired with something. Um, I really want crab dip. With wine number one, I really want something like kind of like rich, a little salty, a little fishy, um, but not over the top. That cream cheese, fresh herbs cut on top, good pita chips. Um, yeah, I really want crab in on it. Wants to tell me that they've got crab dip at their house. Like uh, I'll meet you there in like 20 <laughs> minutes, and I'll bring the wine. Um, um, so Tawana says, I could definitely see that Anna and Anna says number three pairs really well with Mediterranean olives. Okay. So, um, 
Number three, as in um, the Idlewild pairs well with Mediterranean olives. I, I, I'm gonna have to try that out too. That sounds delicious. Um, wine number two, Tawana says, is definitely unique. Maybe some thyme or bay leaf peach if you search for it. Yeah, you gotta search for the fruit, but it's all herbaceous, leather, herby, earthy, leathery kind of up the front. Um, I'm almost getting, <clears throat> I'm almost getting like a um, tum. Fresh, fruity, easy to drink. Um, still has a little bit more of a savory hint to it, but food friendly and um, crisp and clean. Um, this earthy masculine style is both because of the grape, Tiburin, um, and also just the, 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 the winemaking style. They, they pick from old vines, they're making, they're choosing to make a more savory rosé. They're aging it in oak. Um, granted, it's old oak, but that oak aging is going to give it that kind of like richer characteristic to it, a little bit more of that vanilla bean cinnamon component to it. Um, a little bit more depth and complexity rather than bright and fresh and easy to drink. Um, so yes, the grape makes it different and also the winemaking style. That's just how they chose to make uh, this wine. So, um, all right, if you were blindfolded and tasted number four, would you be able to immediately tell it was a rosé? Question from Sama. She's sitting right across from me, but I, I get it. The chat room makes it easier for everyone else to hear uh, what's going on. Um, great question. So, you know, I can't, I can't answer that because it's hypothetical. And they have actually done tests where they've actually taken wine professionals, blindfolded them, and given them two glasses. One was a white wine served at room temperature. One was a red wine served at room temperature. And they had to figure out which one was a white wine. And like 30% of them failed to even figure out which one was a white wine. Because so much of what we think of in terms of white wine or rosé is temperature. So if you were to serve this wine at room temperature, same as a red, and I were blindfolded and I didn't see a color, would I be able to tell as a rosé? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's a sounds like uh, my next YouTube video is going to have to be some experiments on this. Um, but in terms of just how our brains peg rosé, tutti frutti, bright red, pink fruit, candy, watermelon, strawberry, raspberry, um, our our brain doesn't go there with this wine, right? Because the wine isn't like that. Um, this is the style of rosé that I prefer the most, that really super savory masculine style of rosé. So I'm familiar with it, but if I were to taste it room temperature and blindfolded, I don't know. Um, and yes, I'm going to have to now plan a uh, YouTube class on me blinding uh, room temperature, white, red, and rosé to see if I can <laughs> figure out. Uh, I'll do it live so that you know, like I'm not cheating and editing the video. Sounds like a great experiment. Um, You'll need a partner. Yeah, I'll need a couple partners to pour the wine for me because if I pour the wine blindfolded, I, I spill wine <laughs> on my own when I'm not blindfolded, when I'm pouring much less when I'm blindfolded. So that's a great question. I like this. I like this plan. Um, Danielle, didn't care for one or two. Okay, the first two of the rosé, but loved three and four. Interesting, James. So you really like okay, that we had number one two um but danielle really liked three and four that's awesome and i have to give credit to y'all james and danielle because it was your idea that made this class happen you requested a rosé class so if you have other classes anyone out there that that you'd like to see happen um let me know i'm always keen to feature a class that people are interested in so let me know what you're most interested in um so I would not be able to tell number four was a rosé in a blind taste test, uh, Anna says, but I would say funky white. Okay. Cause that acidity is, 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 is more vibrant and you don't have those rich tannins that a red wine has. Um, so, um, yes. All right. Tawana. Great. Fabulous. I might, um, I might, I might ask you for your help. Uh, if I, if I do this class, I'll need some volunteers that you all would enjoy these wines even if it's not something that you'd enjoy just by itself like wine number one was obviously the winner for 
by itself. Chuggable, drink, 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 Anna. Uh, <laughs> um, if 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 um, that was the chuggable wine, um, these two are definitely not that style. But tell me the situation that you would enjoy each of these roses. <sighs> Man, I can't get past this. Um, the smell of this Idlewild. Um, so just so you know a little bit, while, while y'all are typing those answers, Idlewild is one of my favorite producers in California. They only make wine from Italian grape varieties and only Italian grape varieties that are native to the Piedmont or Piemonte region of Italy. So Nebbiolo, Barbera, um, Dolcetto, and Arnace are the four, uh, Arnace is the one wine are the four wines that they, um, are the four grapes that they use. They have some blends, which are great, and those are in the Flora and Fauna series. Um, and then they have single vineyard and single variety wines that will just blow your mind. If you love Italian wine and want to see, like, your horizons expand and see other people produce these Italian grape varieties in a really beautiful, beautiful, like, poetic and stunning way. Um, check out Idlewild's uh, red and white wines. Um, cannot speak highly enough of them. Chloe Sibone, um, we have their, um, right now I'm featuring their white wine, uh, their Vermentino in uh, my six packs. Um, it's called Temptations, it's like their everyday um, uh, wine label. So Idlewild, their everyday label is called the Flora and Fauna series. They have a red, white, and a rose. Um, for Closey Bone, they have the Temptations. Um, Holly Cross, if you're tuned in, um, you love their Closey Bone, the, the red Temptations. Um, and I'm featuring the white now. The rosé is also delicious. But this is their higher end. And then they have an even higher end um, um, that's a single vineyard that uses just grapes that are from vines from 100 plus year old vines. Really, truly incredible rosé. Also, notice. Every other rosé that we've had tonight has been from a 2019 vintage. Um, this wine from Closey Bone is from 2018. This is their current release. This is what is currently in stock. This is not just like leftover wine that I'm selling. Um, certain areas of uh, specifically France and Germany need their rosé to hang out for a year, especially if you're doing any oak aging on it at all. Um, the wine needs to hang out for a little bit more time before it's released to the public. So generally speaking, the springtime is when all rosés are released that are not aged in oak because it gets harvested in the fall. It goes through the fermentation process, gets kind of... Um, it, it hangs out in, in stainless steel tanks and then it gets bottled, hangs out for a couple months and then gets shipped out. So springtime is when it's released. But if it spends six months in oak at all, then all of a sudden it delays that release even longer. So um, this closey bone is definitely like that more Thanksgiving style rosé, a rosé that could be your full dinner. Like I want it with with pan seared mahi mahi, I want um, I want some steaky fish to it. I want I want to sit down and think about this wine and think about the pairing, versus the other wines are more just like eat, drink, and be merry kind of wines. So, um, all right. So wine number one, really just want to enjoy a great conversation, maybe charcuterie for snacking and pleasant evening on the porch. Sounds absolutely delightful. Um, love three and four, um, Steve Hill at Sun Pop. He's not here, but that's my family speaking. Um, love three and four. They taste so novel, like n not like nothing quite like anything I've had before. Yes. And that's the goal of this class is to feature rosés that are out of the box. Um, the first time trying parkour. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. I like how that's that's listed like some mom said that that's definitely my brother who said that I uh, <laughs> can't really imagine my mom trying parkour <laughs> sorry I shouldn't be laughing so hard <laughs> now you're crying <laughs> I'm in trouble now and I might need needing a new delivery driver if anyone knows <laughs> she might oh she might be mad at me after that okay um yes I definitely is reminiscent of the first time I tried parkour <laughs> <laughs> um, so on the scale and say Pinot Noir our class be different. All right, fabulous. Um, 
we just did the the last blind tasting class we did where we did four wines, four regions, but just one grape was Pinot Noir. It was definitely like a blind tasting class, but I like, um, there's going to be some new releases of um, a lot of the uh, Willamette Valley Pinot Noirs are coming out uh, soon. So I might just do a Pinot Noir class featuring different single vineyard Pinot Noirs from Willamette Valley. So I will, I will uh, keep you tuned for that um, great idea for class. Uh, wine number two, Tawana says, I keep going to a Hawaiian turkey burger. Like, does that mean like, um, like a uh, pineapple and like barbecue sauce on it, like a Hawaiian pizza, but a turkey burger? You tell. Like, I'm, I'm, I've never had a Hawaiian turkey burger, but now I'm intrigued. So do, do, do tell. Um, <laughs> uh, Tawana, best for this. So if you want to go, hang out and do some parkour next time. We do some deliveries. Yeah. Um, Anna says we'd be about the Pinot Noir uh, class, especially Oregon versus Sonoma. Interesting. Okay, cool. We might have to do like California versus Oregon uh, Pinot Noir class. That sounds that sounds like a great class. Um, all right. So we've we've tasted four rosés. Have you during this time expanded your idea of what rosé actually tastes like? Um, what rosé is meant to be in your life, um, how to best enjoy it, and and what it and and, and what it has to offer. Um, you want to give me a, like a thumbs up? Oh, um, yes, parkour mom. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> some mom has something to say. <laughs> what, explain orange wine oh, in great. relationship awesome. to great. rosé at all. Fabulous question. Some mom's question is orange wine. What is its relationship to rosé wine? You know, this is a very orange wine. What is orange wine? So orange wine is different than rosé because it's made from white wine grapes. So rosé is made from red wine grapes or a blend of red and white. Orange wine is made exclusively from white wine grapes that have had extended contact of the juice of the white wine with the skins of the white wine. So we talked about how rosé is made from the pressings, the juice being pressed off the skins of red wine grapes after a matter of a few hours so that you do have some pigment, uh, some pink pigment from the red uh, grape skins. White wine grapes, their skin also has pigment and also has tannins, those bitter phenolics like red wine does. But often the actual flavors of the white wine grapes can't stand up to the bitterness of the skins of the grape. So it's usually pressed, the juice is pressed off of the skins of the grape literally within a matter of minutes of the grapes being processed. Uh, orange wine allows the grape juice to hang out with the skins of the grape, either full cluster, whole cluster, partial, whatever, for a matter of time, whether that's six hours, 24 hours, two weeks, whatever it is, depending on the style of wine that they're making. And so you get these bitter phenolics with the wine, almost like a red wine, you get a little bit of this tannin uh, from the skins of the grape and you get deeper coloring and extraction from the skins of the grape, um, but they're all white wine grapes. It's a very unique taste. Um, I gotta be honest, um, there are very few orange wines that I really enjoy. One of my favorites, though, is a Pinot Grigio. They make it in what's called a Ramato style. If anyone ordered a um, Italian six pack for me back in, well, oh, my last my last six pack pre COVID, um, I remember I did this Italian six pack that had um, an Italian Pinot Grigio. It was a Ramato. Ramato is the style of of, of wine that's orange wine. It's Pinot Grigio made with extended skin contact, so it has this like peachish coloring. Um, and um, so, so there are some wines that are like made in a little bit lighter style and some orange wines can be so intense that it literally just, just, just straight up bitter intensity in your mouth and everything in between. So it's definitely an acquired taste. Um, I recommend trying it in small amounts at first. Like don't just like dive in and buy a whole collection of orange wines, um, but definitely check it out. To me, orange wines are definitely like best experienced in the fall. They work really well, like butternut squashes, um, um, all, of, all of your fall dishes um, works really well with orange wines. A little bit too heavy, a little bit too intense, a little bit too bitter and rich for summertime, um, not 
quite the refreshing wines that you want in a hot summer. But definitely check out some orange wines in the fall. Maybe I'll do a little orange wine class um, towards the fall. Um, uh, James says, always educate us about new kinds of wines. I love it. Yes, the goal is, is if you're going you're gonna to attend a class on a Wednesday night with the psalm, um, hopefully it's some new wines for sure. Um, oh, so a, uh, so a Hawaiian burger, turkey burger, pineapple, teriyaki, green onion, and turkey. That sounds delicious. Now I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm down for that. I think that's a great pairing for sure. So Tawana says, I, I always thought I wouldn't like rosé. I definitely have become interested in them since taking your classes, being introduced to the variations and how different they are. Yes, um, most people, if they think rosé is sweet or just that tutti free style, I think they're not. It's a way, especially the savory, more masculine styles, to introduce your red wine lovers into a new category before they start falling in love with white wines because everyone comes full circle. If you think you only like one category, eventually you start um, branching out. That's the goal. Um, scale and say, we'd be more interested in a broader comparison of Pinot Noir regions. But, okay. All right, cool. Um, I, li I like that New Zealand. Um, that sounds like a really fantastic class. Um, well, thank you all so much for tuning in to this Rosé wine class. I hope that um, your July fared well, and uh, so far the July 4th fared well. And I look forward to the next coming classes. We've got blind tasting next week. Um, again, we're going to do one grape. It's a red grape. We're going to different regions and we'll be featured blind. Um, and, um, and then the following class after that, we're going to start a soil series and we're going to start with volcanic vineyards and, and feature wines from volcanic vineyards. We're going to do two white and two red for that class, uh, volcanic vineyards from all around the world talking about why soil matters. Um, what difference does it make in the flavor of the wines in the end? So, um, yes. Someone, someone wants to know when the video is over, which wine are you going to refill your glass with? Ooh. One, two, three, or four. Great question. So Samam's question is, which wine will I personally refill my glass with when the video is anyone, over with? Anyone, oh, oh, anyone. Everyone. Gotcha. Sorry. Um, so Samam wants to know for you, you all, um, what what are you going to refill your glass with um, at the end? Which wine? One, two, three, or four, or maybe something totally different. Maybe a gin and tonic or a cabernet. <laughs> I don't know. Um, tell me what you're going to be drinking after this class. Um, and again, if you ever have any ideas about other classes, please shoot me an email, text, message, Facebook, Instagram, anything. I'd love to, um, get some other fun classes on the books. And, and if there's, uh, anything that you want to do just privately for a zoom event, still not doing like private events in people's homes and stuff like that. Um, I coordinate with wine stores all over the world now so um i'm happy to um coordinate with you and your friends and family from all over so that we can do a private event if you are interested so um daniel is testing out her new core event with number four yes if anyone has any more questions about core events i'm going to do another video soon about um how to best use a core event and little tips and uh tricks to make sure that you're getting the most uh use out of it so um, James says, already had another glass of number two. I like that. Um, Lori says, number three. So we've got some Idlewild. We've got some Chocolate. Um, number one, Chagaval. Yes. Um, number, let's see, some number one as well. Um, oh, yeah, I like that. Um, Chris is, that's my favorite answer. He's going to have to taste them all again to decide <laughs> which one to, uh, to pour the glass of. That's my favorite. So... Ah, I love it. Some mom says she has a date with number four to learn to like it. Okay. Yeah. And if you need to learn to like it, just always remember it just probably needs food. If you ever taste the wine, you're like, I'm appreciation of the wine. So, um, and you are so welcome for giving you an excuse to drink on a Wednesday. It is absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for giving me an excuse to drink on a Wednesday and call it my job. <laughs> uh, it is absolutely my pleasure to do these classes. Um, thank you all so much. I look forward to seeing you again soon, um, whether just delivering wine or at one of these next classes. Um, until then, stay safe, stay sane, and stay healthy. Cheers. <laughs>